Welcome to our third annual We Love Our Book Clubs event. Um, very sad that I won't be able to see you all in person. We usually do get to meet in person, but I am a little bit glad that I don't have to go out in the freezing cold tonight. So thank you for joining. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brenna Murphy. I'm the Reader's Advisory Librarian here at the Glen Allen Library. I'm presenting tonight with Rebecca Vanuk. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Um, she's gonna tell you a little bit more about herself and her organization, Library Reads, in just a moment. Um, first, I'm gonna give you an overview of what we have planned for the night. And while I'm doing that, I would love to hear from you all in the chat. Um, we're gonna be talking about a whole bunch of books tonight, but I would also love to know what your favorite book was in 2020. Um, in order to use the chat, just change the, um, the section that says two to be all panelists and all attendees, and then everyone will be able to see what you're commenting. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So main event tonight, Rebecca and I have 20 books that we are ready to tell you about that are all great book discussion books. Um, they all come out within the last year. I think there's a few that are coming out in the next couple of months, but all new stuff. Um, after that, we're going to do a Q&A session. So some of you have already sent in some questions. If you haven't, that's fine. But if you think of anything that has to do with book recommendations or anything to do with running a book club, um, just think about that. And when we get to the Q&A session, you can type it in the chat and we will respond there. And we would love to hear from you in the chat all night. So if we're talking about a book and you have a comment or a question, um, just type that in the chat and we are checking it. Um, after that, we're going to be doing a grand prize raffle. So we have what I call a book club basket. I know you can't totally tell what's in this photo here, so I will tell you. Um, there is a $50 gift card to the Glen Ellen Chamber of Commerce that you can use at any store in Glen Ellen. Um, I had the idea that you could buy books with it, but you don't have to. <laughs> There's also some, uh, some stuff that you can share with the rest of your book club. So we've got 10 individual little packs of chocolates. Um, you can eat them yourself. You know, you don't have to share it with your book club if you don't want to. Um, but we also have some little wine charms and we have some bookmarks that were actually made by Marilyn, who's one of our local book clubbers. And I know she's in the audience tonight. She very kindly designed and created some bookmarks that are in there as well. So um, anybody who's in attendance is going to be able to win. We're gonna do that at the end of the evening. So um, Rebecca, do you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself and about Library Reads? Yeah, so thanks for having me again this year. Um, it was a lot of fun coming in person last year. And like you, I'm sad that I don't get to see everybody again and we didn't get those delicious treats that you had for us. But um, this is also cool. I'm very glad as well to not be going out in the cold. Um, and I feel like sometimes these online events are great because people who might not have been able to come out can always view it, which is awesome. So uh, I am Rebecca Vanuk, the executive director for Library Reads. And Library Reads, if you haven't heard of us before, we're an organization that creates a list of the most anticipated upcoming adult book titles every month that are voted on by library staff across the country. So it's kind of like a pre-pub um, list of librarian favorites, basically, is, is how it works. So you can find out more about us on our website, which is librarireads.org. And on that website, you will find the current list for the month, as well as an archive of over 1,000 library staff recommended reads from 2013 on. Um, in our archive that we have, it's a spreadsheet, so you can sort it by different things. And one of the things that I'm working on right now, as a matter of fact, hope to be done by the end of the month, is having a tab that you can sort. We will start marking books that are good for book clubs. So you can go to that archive and just click, click on that and select um, books that we've identified as good book club picks. So hopefully that'll be really cool for you guys. Thank you. I also just wanna talk really quick about our book club service here at the library. Um, I'm the coordinator for that service. And a lot of you are already signed up, but I know there's a few that aren't. So the way it works is you, um, you have to have at least one person who lives in Glen Allen. It is intended for local book clubs. Uh, but you sign up with us and you tell me um, what books you're reading the day that you're reading them and I will get copies for you and put them at the drive up window for you to pick up. And I can also do recommendations and discussion guides and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, if you sign up, you also get access to more than 40 of what I call book bundles. And those are all books that are um, discussion friendly. A lot of them are some of the newer bestseller books. You get access to those when you sign up. Um, there's a really quick overview. If you have any more questions, my contact info is going to be at the end of the presentation. So you can always reach out to me. 
And I already see some um, Q&A questions, which is awesome. We will awesome. get to those a little bit later. Um, but for now, let's get started with our books. And I just want to mention that I'm going to be emailing a handout to everyone when we're done. And that's going to have all these books and all the information that's on the slides. So don't feel like you have to be taking notes or anything. We're going to send this to you later. So Rebecca, if you want to get us started with our first book. All right, cool. So the first book I selected was The Children's Blizzard by Melanie Benjamin. A deadly snowstorm roared through the Great Plains on January 12th, 1888, at a time when many children were in school with teachers who were little older than themselves. This is historical fiction based on actual oral histories of survivors of the event and told from the perspectives of teachers, students, and the media. I think this book would be perfect for clubs who enjoy historical fiction and could really make a great discussion if you paired it with nonfiction books or articles on the actual event. Okay, my first pick is The Girl with the Louding Voice by Abby Dare. Um, this was one of my favorite books of 2020. I talk about it all the time. It's um, just a deeply moving, heartwarming story. It's set in Nigeria and our main character is Aduni and she's 14 years old. Um, her mother has just passed away and her father sells her to a local family to be the third husband of this man. And, you know, she's 14, she's got really big dreams of becoming a teacher and getting an education. education. So she is not super excited about this arrangement. Um, she ends up running away and she goes to Lagos, which is the capital of Nigeria and ends up working as a maid for a wealthy family there. And I say made very loosely because essentially she's a slave because she never gets paid for the work that she does. Um, and there she gets a glimpse into the high society in Nigeria. Um, the family is extremely wealthy and they really look down on people who are poor and uneducated. Um, but the whole time she's just working towards this dream. She wants to become a teacher and do her thing. And she meets some other characters who are um, on her side and want to help her um, make that dream come true. Uh, what I love about this book is that you are just rooting for her the whole time. You're like, she's such a warm and bright character and you're just like, yes, I want her to make it through and see her dreams happen. Um, I think this will appeal to people who like uh, international settings. As I said, it's set in Nigeria. If you like inspiring main characters and kind of uplifting, hopeful tales, I think you'll like this. Um, as for some read-alikes, if you liked Homegoing by Ya Jesse or Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I think you would like this one. Um, once again, that is The Girl with the Louding Voice by Abby Dare. So my next one is also a little bit on the uplifting side. I think that this year, Brenna, you'll probably agree, right? That like, we're sort of looking for stuff that's a little more comforting and a little like more lighthearted. So I thought this would be a really good choice for that one. Um, this is Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. And in this um, very thin novel also, so it's easy to read too. You don't have to feel, some of the other ones I have are, are big, thick ones. This is a nice, slim, slender book. And here we have a small cafe that features something odd and almost magical. If someone sits in a particular chair and a cup of coffee is poured for them, they can travel to the past for as long as it takes the cup to cool. In this brief story, the lives of customers and staff intertwine, and four hopeful people sit in the chair. So the book does deal with different kinds of loss, but ultimately it's warm and uplifting. I think this would be great for clubs looking for something a little soothing in these trying times. Absolutely, I agree with everything you have said. <laughs> Uh, my next pick is our first nonfiction of the evening. It is Hidden Valley Road Inside the Mind of an American Family by Robert Kolker. Um, I think this is one that will appeal to people who are interested in like medical history. Uh, what I really liked about it is that it's a combination of like kind of this dense research about the history of schizophrenia, um, but it's also a very personal story. So it's about the Galvin family and they raised 12 children in Colorado um, from like the 50s through the early 70s. And six out of those 12 children ended up being diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, all boys. And they ended up, since like there wasn't a whole lot known about the illness at that time, they ended up being uh, studied pretty intensely and they contributed a lot to um, the medical knowledge that we have now. But it's also very personal. Um, 
they talk about, you know, being institutionalized and the effect of having so many family members with mental illness, like what it was like to grow up in that kind of a situation. Um, it also really goes into the different treatments that were available for schizophrenia at the time. So like the history of lobotomies is terrifying and fascinating and they go into that. Um, they also talk about shock therapy, the different medications, um, the institutions that were common at the time. Um, it's really well researched, really engaging and well written. I think this would appeal to you if you like that family biography combined with the medical history aspect, um, as well as well researched nonfiction. Uh, as for read-alikes, um, not so much in terms of theme, but in terms of writing style, it was very similar to Killers of the Flower Moon by David Gran and A Bad Blood by John Kerry Rue. So once again, that is Hidden Valley Road. I almost picked that one too, actually, Brenna, because <laughs> I thought that was a really good nonfiction and it got such good reviews when it came out and, and really just kind of kind of fascinating. So yeah, definitely. All right, so my next one is The Second Home by Christina Clancy. So this is a debut novel um, of family secrets that's told through the shifting perspectives of Anne, Poppy, and their foster brother, Michael. The narrative moves seamlessly between a past summer spent at the family's Cape Cod vacation house and the present, which finds Anne, a single mother, in charge of selling the house after their parents die. Poppy is halfway across the world somewhere surfing and needs to be tracked down, and Michael is nowhere to be found after he ran away after the last fateful summer. Um, this is actually one of my favorite books of 2020, and I will say that part of it is because the, um, the, the bulk of the narrative is, takes place on Cape Cod at this vacation home, but the family is actually from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is where I'm from, and the author really got a lot of the details about Milwaukee correct, and I really like that kind of stuff, um, and the characters are just so very realistic, and that really is a good um, indication of whether or not I'm going to like something, if it's characters that I can relate to and that are realistic. So I think this would be a really good choice for clubs who like nuanced, realistic characters and who are into family drama, because there's a lot of secrets going on here. So it's a good one. I feel like family drama is always a good seller for- I know, right? <laughs> there's always so much to talk about. <laughs> All right, my next pick is Shara Me and Major Whittlesey by Kathleen Rooney. Um, she is the author of Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk, which I think is another great book club pick. I recommend it all the time. If you ever listen to things that I say, I talk about that book a lot. Um, this one's more of a historical fiction. So it's set during World War I. Um, the main character, bear with me here, it's a homing pigeon. So parts of the book are written from the perspective of a pigeon, but it works, just go with it. It's kind of like um, the art of racing in the rain that's written from the dog's perspective, but it, it totally works. Um, so that's one character and it was actually a real pigeon. Um, she is stuffed and on display at the Smithsonian. So a lot of, actually pretty much everything that happens in this book is based on true events. Um, the other character is Major Whittlesey and he is kind of your strong, courageous war hero type. Um, he's the commander of a regiment. And this takes place, as I said, during World War I, during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, which was actually the second deadliest battle in American history. And so what happened is that there were 550 men who were trapped. They were surrounded by the enemy. Um, they had no way of getting contact out to um, their superiors to let them know where they were. So their bet was on this pigeon who kind of saved the day and they attached a message and the pigeon got it out and it, it saved all these people. Um, so what I loved about this, as I said, it's based on true events. So I learned a lot that I didn't know about World War I history. Um, I think if you're interested in historical fiction, you're gonna love this one. As I said, unique characters. I know it's a pigeon, give it a try. Um, it's a redemptive story. Um, if you were a fan of The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna or The Alice Network by Kate Quinn, I think you would like this one. That is Shara Me and Major Whittlesey by Kathleen Rooney. All right, so my next one is definitely different. 
Um, I think Westerns are not really something that most book clubs kind of think about. I think a lot of readers probably don't even think about it, but they are still out there and still being written. And this one is a really interesting one. So in Outlawed by Anna North, um, you know, bank robberies and women's health topics are probably not natural companions, but North weaves them together seamlessly in this alternate history Western. Cast out of her hometown for failure to get pregnant after the first year of marriage, Ada joins the notorious Hole in the Wall gang and becomes an outlaw, all the while seeking real medical information about pregnancy and fertility. So this is a very unusual topic and an even more unusual setting. Um, so I think though it would make a great choice for book clubs that are looking for something different. Um, you know, everybody, we all know the 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 family drama that we're talking about a lot of these books, that's not what's here. This is definitely something very different. So if your club is looking for something new to try out, um, this is definitely really well written. Um, it also has lots of strong female characters um, and it's fast paced. So it's a, it's a fun read also. Um, and if you are interested, I've got a couple other coming down the list too. Uh, Library Reads, we did a Author interview, video, author interview video, sorry, with some of these authors um, in October. And that is on, you can find that on our website. We have a YouTube channel. And Anna North is one of the authors that we interviewed. And listening to her talk about how she kind of came up with this idea and how she plotted it out is absolutely fascinating. So I think that's also kind of fun for book clubs too, when you get to sort of see the author's perspective about it. So give that a try. You can find it on our website. Yeah, I, I don't know if I should say this, but I'm not usually a huge fan of Westerns, but I, I know this is one that I could enjoy. And I also, I love everything that Reese Witherspoon chooses for her book club. So I that's on my to, to read list for sure. See, I think that that's what's kind of interesting is right. Westerns are like, people are like, I don't read Westerns. And I think if they gave this a try, they'd be like, uh, who knew? So yeah, yeah, very cool. All right, my next pick is Transcendent Kingdom by Yaa Jesse. Um, she is the author of Homegoing, which came out about five years ago and is probably one of my all-time favorite books. Um, what I think makes this so discussable is that there's so many themes going on. Um, so I'll try and break it down for you. Um, the main character is Gifty and she's getting her PhD in neuroscience from Stanford. And what she's studying are patterns of addiction in mice. And the reason she's so interested in this is because she had a brother who passed away as a teenager um, from an opioid overdose. So she's just like totally diving into this academic research because of this tie she has with her brother. Um, a lot of the story is told in flashbacks. So um, you hear about her childhood. Her parents are immigrants from Ghana who moved to Alabama, which as you can imagine is a huge culture shock. Um, and then this tragedy happens with her brother and her and her mother kind of just never managed to get their relationship back. So in modern times, her mom is kind of having a breakdown. She's having a really hard time. She's not over the death of her son. And she moves in with Gifty in her tiny apartment in California. And, you know, they've had all these struggles, but now they're forced to share a space. So they have to learn to communicate and support each other. Um, as I said, there are so many different themes here. You've got um, addiction, mental illness, trauma, grief, immigrant experience, um, goes into religion, academia. I feel like you could talk about this for three hours because there's just so much going on. Um, and she's a brilliant writer. It's just so well written. Uh, so this will appeal to you if you like that mother-daughter relationship thing. Um, it's culturally diverse, complex characters. If you liked The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, which was probably my favorite book of 2020, um, you'll like this one or um, if you liked An American Marriage by Tayari Jones, I think you would also enjoy this. That is Transcendent Kingdom by Yaa Jesse. All right, my next pick is some nonfiction. This is Confident Women, Swindlers, Grifters, and Shapeshifters of the Feminine Persuasion by Tori Telfer. It's a thoroughly entertaining and darkly humorous roundup of history's notorious but often forgotten female con artists and their bold, outrageous scams by the acclaimed author of Lady Killers. Uh, Tori Telfer also runs a podcast, a very popular podcast about um, true crime focused on women. So in this book though, the art of the con has a long and venerable tradition and its female practitioners are some of the best 
or should I say worst? <laughs> Confident Women asks the provocative question, where does chutzpah intersect with a uniquely female pathology? And how were these notorious women able to do so spectacularly dupe and swindle their victims? Uh, this would be a really good choice for groups that like true crime um, and history. She actually goes, I think the first Women, woman that we meet, um, we, she goes back to like 1915 and then all the way through modern times. And I think it was really kind of cool because most of the time when you think of like con artists, you don't think of women, you think of men and you think of, you know, catch me if you can and all the kind of like famous stuff like that. But Tori Telfer really kind of digs deep to find some of these notorious women, which was kind of a, a cool take on it. Um, she's another author that we interviewed for the series that's on our website. And again, she's really upbeat and interesting. And she talked about all of the research that she did to find out about these women and how she decided to write about them. So this, this would be a good, um, watching the video would be a good companion to a club. I'm a huge fan of true crime, so. Definitely interested in this Awesome. One. All right, my next pick is The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr. This is historical fiction. It's set during the era of slavery in Mississippi. Um, if you are a fan of Toni Morrison, you'll definitely wanna pick this one up. It gave me very strong Toni Morrison vibes. Um, so there's a whole, a lot of characters in this book, but your two main characters are Samuel and Isaiah. Um, they are two gay men who fall in love and they grew up on the plantation together. Obviously life is terrible, but they kind of have each other and they have this comfort um, through all the trials that they go through. Um, as I said, you hear from a lot of other characters. So for example, you hear from Maggie, who's a cook and housekeeper in the main house. You also hear from the owners of the plantation. Um, I feel like this is the kind of book that needs to be read slowly. Um, obviously any book about slavery tends to be pretty heavy um, and there's like a lot to digest so I found this book was like okay I'll read a chapter tonight and then you know I'll come back to it tomorrow because you also really want to like think about the things that the author's saying and the writing is just so lyrical and haunting and beautiful that you really want to sink it in. Um, religion also plays a big role in this book. Uh, a lot of the chapters are named after chapters of the Bible and a lot of the characters have biblical names. Um, if you are a fan of, as I said, historical fiction, LGBTQIA plus characters, uh, I think it's so rare to see queer, queer characters in historical fiction. I don't think that I've encountered that in stories about slavery before, um, so it's really great to see it here. Um, if you're a fan of The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead or Sing Unburied Sing by Jasmine Ward, or as I said, Toni Morrison, I think you will like this one. Um, Liz in the chat is saying that she just ordered it and she's waiting for it to come. I hope you enjoy it. All right, my next pick is The Kindest Lie by Nancy Johnson. So this debut novel from Chicago author Johnson begins on the eve of the 2008 election at a watch party hosted by Ruth and Xavier. Ruth must soon confess a secret. She had a child as a teenager, but walked away to begin a whole new life. When she returns to her hometown to sort things out, she begins a friendship with Midnight, a troubled 11-year-old white boy. Their interconnected paths are brilliantly told and explore themes of race, money, pride, and finding your way back home. Um, this book has gotten rave reviews and it's getting a lot of press right now, which is awesome. I also thought it was cool that she's a Chicago author, yay! Um, so I thought this would make a good pick for clubs who are interested in family dynamics and contemporary issues. Uh, so for those of you who joined late, yes, there will be a list of the books. I'm going to email it out at the end of the evening. Um, someone had asked in the chat. My next read is The Night Swim by Megan Golden. Um, if you're a mystery suspense fan, you'll definitely want to pick this up. Um, so the main character here is Rachel. She is a true crime podcaster. As I said earlier, I love true crime. So right away I was hooked. Um, and Rachel has moved to this small town in North Carolina to cover a high profile sexual assault trial that's going on in the town. Um, so the accused is the town it boy. He's um, on his way to the Olympics as a swimmer. His parents are wealthy. They're, his family's very well respected in the town. Um, a lot of this might sound kind of similar to some stories you've seen in the news lately, and I think the author is doing that intentionally, kind of tying it into the Me Too movement. Um, so as Rachel is studying um, 
or she's covering this case in the courts, she starts receiving letters from a woman named Hannah whose sister um, died under mysterious circumstances about 25 years ago. And as she digs into these cases, she starts to find that um, the two are actually very similar and there's something deeper going on in this town. Um, the writing style is super engaging. It's definitely a page turner. You're like, what's gonna happen? Um, the author mixes it up. So a lot of it's from Rachel's perspective, but you also get excerpts from the podcast. Um, you get to read the letters that are um, given to her by Hannah, who's the woman with the sister who had passed away. Um, if you're into audiobooks, it's a great one to listen to. As I said, you know, I'm a true crime podcast fanatic. So if you're into that, you'll like this one. Um, but even if you're not, if you just like psychological suspense, um, mysteries, as I said, it's got this Me Too tie-in. I think you'll wanna pick it up. Um, some read-alikes are The Guest List by Lucy Foley and The Silent Patient by Alex Michaelides. So if you liked either of those, you'll want to um, pick this one up. It is The Night Swim by Megan Golden. All right, my next pick is another nonfiction. This is Made in China, A Prisoner, An SOS Letter, and The Hidden Cost of America's Cheap Goods. In 2012, an Oregon mother named Julie Keith opened up a package of Halloween decorations and something fell out that she wasn't expecting, an SOS letter, handwritten in broken English by the prisoner who'd made and packaged the items. Investigative journalist Amelia Pang pulls back the curtain on the labor camps that create the countless goods we purchase in the United States. The book follows the life of Sun Yi, the Chinese engineer who wrote the note after finding himself political prisoner, locked in a gulag for joining a forbidden meditation practice and campaigning for the freedom to do so. The story that Pang uncovers is a call to action, urging American consumers to ask more questions and demand more answers from the companies they patronize. This is a good nonfiction choice for clubs interested in social issues and current events. Um, Amelia Pang is a well-known and well-respected in, um, investigative journalist, and she really brings an engaging narrative to this story. Um, she's also another author that is in our video series, so go and check that out if you're interested. It's Made in China. I actually just started listening to this one yesterday. Oh, cool. And as you mentioned, the beginning of the book, she opens up these Halloween decorations and finds a letter from someone who is in um, a Chinese work camp. And it, it's like the best hook ever. After I read that, I was like, I've got to find out what's going on here. Right? I mean, that's what I really, when I, you know, someone asked, and I know we'll answer it later, but like, what do you look for when you're choosing books? And for me, when it comes to nonfiction, that hook that you just mentioned, right? Like I look for nonfiction that's written in a very engaging style. And, and this one definitely fits the bill. My next pick is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. Um, and Rebecca, earlier you were saying how right now sometimes you just need like a feel good kind of pick you up book for these times. This is definitely one of those. Yeah, totally. Admittedly, it does start out really sad, but I promise it picks up by the end. Um, so it's a book about Nora. She's a woman in her 30s and she's kind of going through a life crisis. Um, her career is not what she wants. Her relationships aren't great. She has um, issues with her family. And basically she's just very fixated on all these regrets that she has in life. And so one night in a moment of desperation, she stumbles upon what is called the Midnight Library. And here's how the library works. Um, every book in this library is an alternate life that she could have had. So she picks up the book and starts reading and she's transported into this alternate life. So one of them, it's like, you know, what if she had married her ex-boyfriend and they opened up a pub in the English countryside? So like, bam, she's in that life and she finds out how it would have gone. And another one, she becomes an Olympic swimmer. And another one, she moves with her best friend to Australia. Um, and of course, as she's hopping between these lives, she starts to realize, you know, maybe what she thought was important isn't all that important. Um, and she starts to learn kind of about herself and what she really wants in her life. Um, I, what I liked about this is that it's, it's very much a contemporary fiction, but it also has that little hint of fantasy. Um, so if you like kind of the fantasy and the self-discovery kind of element, if you like books set in England, which is always, you know, a selling point for me, um, and kind of the unusual premise of the Midnight Library, I think you'll like this one. For read-alikes, if you liked The Time Traveler's Wife or Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. I think you would want to pick this one up. Once again, that is The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. 
All right, my next pick is The Arctic Fury by Greer McAllister. Based on real people, a dozen women join a secret 1850s Arctic expedition and a sensational murder trial unfolds when some of them don't come back. Eccentric Lady Jane Franklin makes an outlandish offer to adventurer Virginia Reeve. Take a dozen women, trek into the Arctic, and find her husband's lost expedition. Four search parties have failed to find him, and Lady Franklin wants a radical new approach. Put the women in charge. A year later, Virginia stands trial for murder. Survivors of the expedition willing to publicly support her sit in the front row, but there are only five. What happened out there on the ice? This is a thrilling read, um, very adventurous, recommended for groups that like historical fiction and fiction with a great sense of place. Um, I actually did an interview with this author la last month and we talked about that and so many readers were saying that the Arctic is practically another character in this book. So if your group likes really strong settings, this is a great choice for that. Um, Lady Jane Franklin and the, the missing Franklin expedition is actually at real events and real people. Um, Virginia Reeve and the dozen of the dozen women that went out to find him are not real, but it is inspired by true events, which is also kind of cool. And I think it would make a great book club selection to kind of balance that with some um, articles or pieces on actual Arctic expeditions of the time. Oh, and this is a big one. That's a, it's a big thick book. So give your folks plenty of time to read it. <laughs> Good to know. You might need like an extra month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. My next pick is Between Two Kingdoms, a memoir of a life interrupted by Suleika Jawad. Um, she is a New York Times columnist. And this book is about her five-year battle with cancer. So the story begins, she's 22, she's just graduated from Princeton, she moved to Paris and she's just loving her young adult life. Uh, but she starts having these weird symptoms. So she's tired all the time, she's itchy, she's losing a ton of weight. At first she's like, well, it's, you know, it's in my head or it's my lifestyle or something. Um, but it keeps getting worse and she eventually gets a diagnosis of leukemia and moves back in with her family in the States. And so the next few years are about her treatment. So she gets chemo, radiation, bone marrow transplants, um, the whole thing. And it, it goes into her relationship with her family. She's got an amazingly supportive boyfriend, her family, her friends. But she also starts writing this column for the New York Times that is about her battle with cancer. And she makes all these friends on the internet through that. And she starts making connections with other people who have had cancer um, and it becomes very popular. And so the second half of the book is about this road trip that she takes and it's a hundred day journey. She drives across the U.S. and she's meeting in real life all these people that had kind of supported her through the internet during her uh, journey with cancer. And um, so one of them is like a teacher grieving the loss of her son. Another is a man who's on death row. Um, you know, any book that deals with cancer is going to be pretty heavy. Um, since it's a memoir, you do know that she survives, so there is some comfort in that, but it is definitely, you know, hard to read at times. Um, but it's really beautifully written. Um, her story is just amazing. Um, so if you like books about cancer survivors, if you like travel writing, um, the themes of like heartbreak and rebirth, you'll want to check this one out. Uh, it reminded me of Being Mortal by Atul Gawande, or Maybe You Should Talk to Someone by Lori Gottlieb. Um, so once again, that is Between Two Kingdoms by Sulika Jawad. All right, my next one is Take It Back by Kia Abdullah. When Jody, a 16-year-old girl, accuses four boys in her class of an unthinkable crime, the community is torn apart. After all, these four teenage defendants are from hardworking Muslim immigrant families, and they all have proven alibis. Even Jody's best friend doesn't believe her. The only one who does believe her is Zara Khalil, a former high-powered attorney who now works as a sexual assault advocate. Zara is determined to fight for Jody, to find the truth in the face of public outcry. And as issues of sex, race, and social justice collide, the most explosive criminal trial of the year builds to a shocking conclusion. I thought this would be a good pick for groups that are interested in social issues, um, for groups that can handle the sexual nature of the, the crimes. 
um, and it's gotten the the suspense is really like palpable. I think um, oftentimes legal thrillers are written by men or they have, you know, the male protagonist or the male perspective. And so this to me was very interesting to have a female legal thriller. So I thought that would be a really good pick for groups that can handle that kind of thing. Okay, my next pick is Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. Um, this is one of the ones, I think it comes out in March, so it's not out quite yet. Uh, but he is the author of Never Let Me Go and Remains of the Day. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2017, um, so he's a very famous author. And this book is an interesting combination of literary fiction and science fiction. So if you've read Never Let Me Go, it's very similar to that book in that way. And this is a book that I can't tell you too much about the plot or I'll totally give away all the fun. So I'll just tell you a little bit. Um, so Clara is the main character and she is an artificial friend, AKA a robot. And when the book starts, she's kind of living in this shop waiting for someone to take her home. And that person ends up being 14 year old Josie. So um, she moves in with Josie and is her uh, companion, which is her you know, role as a robot. And it quickly becomes apparent that Josie has some health issues and everyone around her is trying to uh, think of a way to help her get better. Um, and Clara is doing that as well. It's probably about all I can say. Uh, but I think this will appeal to anyone with an interest in technology. And it has kind of this uh, futuristic dystopian feel. Um, it ties into um, like environmental and social issues. So it also feels current in a way. Um, if you were a fan of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, or anything written by Haruki Murakami, I think you would like this. So once again, that is Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. All right, for my last pick, I have The Office of Historical Corrections by Danielle Evans. So Evans is widely acclaimed for her blisteringly smart voice and X-ray insights into complex human relationships. In this collection, which is a novella and short stories, Evan zooms in on particular moments and relationships in her characters' lives in a way that allows them to speak to larger issues of race, culture, and history. She introduces readers to Black and multicultural characters who are experiencing the universal confusions of lust and love and getting walloped by grief, all while exploring how history haunts us personally and collectively. Ultimately, she provokes us to think about the truths of American history, about who gets to tell the stories and the cost of setting the record straight. I think this would be really good for groups who are interested in exploring short story collections, as well as those who like literary fiction. Um, it is very literary, but also very relatable. Um, I think that the themes of, you know, st again, strong female protagonists, racism, grief, trauma, family dynamics, um, all really good, you know, juicy book club stuff. And I think that a lot of clubs don't always gravitate to short story collections or things like that. And this would be a really good place to start. The stories are so sort of connected, but not really. You can read them individually, you can read them as a group, and I think that that might appeal to a lot of people as well. Yeah, kind of like what you were saying, I think that book clubs don't give enough love to short story collections, so I think it's good, like, if you want to spice it up and read something different, short yeah. story books would be a good way to go. Totally, totally. All right, this is our last book recommendation of the evening. So quick reminder right now, if you have anything that you wanna talk about during our Q&A session, start thinking about that, putting it in the chat. Also, if you have a book that you would like to recommend to us, you can also put that in the chat. So this is The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. Um, she's the author of The Nightingale and the Great Alone. And if you've read her books before, you know that you need to have like at least one box of tissues next to you the whole time because they are just like so emotional and heartbreaking. So I'm warning you now. Uh, this one is set uh, mostly in Texas. It's a Great Depression Dust Bowl era story. And it's set in a farming community and it's, you know, it's a terrible time, it's the Dust Bowl. So there's poverty, there's homelessness, starvation. Um, a lot of people are taking off out west to try and find something better, but some people are kind of sticking it out on their farm and trying to make it work. So the main character is Elsa, 
She's kind of your typical strong female character. She's a mother. She's a hard worker. Her marriage has not been what she wanted or expected, but she's kind of someone who makes the best of her circumstances. And her relationship with her daughter is central to the book. So we also hear Lorita's perspective. You know, as I said, it's a story of trials and heartbreak. Um, they end up leaving Texas and going out to California to try and find something better. Um, but it turns out life for a migrant worker in California is also not great. Um, so I learned a lot about the Dust Bowl era through this book. I mean, I know it was terrible, but, you know, stuff like kids wearing gas masks and, you know, it was really, really rough. Um, so if you're a fan of historical fiction, fascinating characters, emotional storytelling, as I said, bring your tissues. Um, if you are a fan of Orphan Train by Christina Baker Klein or Before We Were Yours by Lisa Wingate, I think you'll like this one. And this just came out last week and I just received our bundle set. So I have 10 copies set aside for book club. So if you wanna read this one, let me know and I can make sure that you get it. All right. So let's move on to our Q and A. So um, some of you did send in some questions ahead of time. So I'm gonna start with those and I can see some of you are um, putting things in the chat as well. So we'll make sure we get to those. Um, so the first question is, do you pick your books for the entire year or a few months at a time? And that's something you all can answer in the chat as well because every book club does it different. Um, Rebecca, do you have any thoughts? You know, um, back when I used to run book clubs at the library, or at different libraries that I've worked at actually, um, I would, you know, we always would try and schedule stuff as far out as we could so that people could make sure, you know, they could see the whole list at one time. They could make sure we had enough copies of everything. But I think there is something kind of nice to only doing a couple months ahead at a time so that you can switch it up, um, especially if something comes out that maybe you weren't prepared for or didn't hear about ahead of time. Um, so I think it really depends on the group and what they are interested in and you know what, what dynamics work for them best. Absolutely. I know some groups have like each person brings their own book and they choose it for that month. Um, yeah. I yeah. run I run the book club at the library in Glen Ellen and I choose three books at a time um, like a few months ahead. So right now I'm choosing our books for summer. And the main thing that I'm always thinking about is, am I getting like a wide selection? So choosing authors who are diverse in terms of uh, race, gender, nationality, am I getting fiction, nonfiction? Um, just trying to take all that stuff into account. Yeah. It's like the whole, you know, so many books, so little time problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of, if you, if you pick out too far ahead, you feel a little locked into it sometimes. Yeah. Um, Jean is saying they choose a year at a time. And yeah, that can be good and bad. Okay, uh, next question is, how do you come up with titles? Um, do you have your members give suggestions or you, do you use book lists? Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, so I always really prefer to get feedback from the members. Um, I think that that's important to keep people engaged and you know, wanting to feel, it, feel part of it. Um, I know a couple of groups. Um, I've got a friend that's in a group where everybody is responsible for picking, I think, two books per year. So like they know ahead of time what their month is and they have to pick it and they have to explain why they chose it. And I think that that really gives people a good amount of ownership into it. Um, but I think that's also kind of a trap because you could, you know, you could end up with people who only want to read the same things over and over again. So I suppose if you had enough people in your group to make it a good amount of picks, that's pretty good. Um, but the biggest fear for me is always if you're picking stuff that you know you like, that can be really hard because sometimes I think someone even mentioned it sort of in the comments that when everybody likes the book, there it ends up being not a lot to discuss <laughs> You know, you kind of sit around and go, yeah, we all loved it, the end. Um, but for me, what I always would get so nervous about was if I chose a book that I really liked, I kind of didn't want to hear if anybody didn't like it. And so then that always sort of stifled discussion as well. So I do, I do think it's good, though, to get um, as much participation as you can, just so people really feel ownership of the group. So, yeah, I always think it's a lot more fun if at least one person hated it. Because right. <laughs> 
get all that emotion and you get some contrasting opinions. Yes. Then you can actually have a real needy discussion about stuff. Yeah. Anita is saying in the chat that they have a rule. At least one person must have read the book. Uh, so I guess before they. Beforehand. Before yeah. The book club, that's a good idea. I play fast and loose when I choose my book club books and I usually haven't read them. So Same. <laughs> I'm like, I haven't read it. I didn't know that it was going to be bad. Sorry. I know. Then you, <laughs> it's always like, oh no, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So a few groups are telling me their favorites of 2020. I just want to call those out really quick. Um, the, let's start at the beginning here. Um, Jean is saying she loved the overstory, the great believers and the night watchmen. Uh, great believers was my favorite book of 2019. So good. Um, the page turners say their favorites were Deacon King Kong, or their favorite was Deacon King Kong by James McBride. I've heard that one is great. I have. I've heard that too. Yeah. And Crescent Club says their most surprising book that they liked was Oil and Marble by Stephanie Story. Oh, I haven't heard of that one. Um, Liz says 2020 favorites, The Vanishing Half, Behold the Dreamers, and Sugar. As I said, Vanishing Half was my hands down favorite of 2020. All right, so, okay. Progressive readers say they loved A Good Neighborhood and A Burning. Oh. Yes. Yeah, A Good Neighborhood was another, when I was thinking about what my favorite books of 2020 were, A Good Neighborhood really rose to the top. And that was one actually that I um, talked about last year when we did this was A Good Neighborhood. It was a, it's, it's a good, a good juicy, juicy family secrets, family dynamics story. Yes. It's also fairly short, but it packs a punch. So it's it packs good. a punch big time. <laughs> um, and then uh, Chris also says their favorite was where the crawdads sing for Wednesday night readers book club. Yeah. That was a big hit. Um, I guess 2019. Yeah. Um, okay. So someone had asked earlier in the evening, what elements do you look for in a book? Like what makes it good for a book discussion? And I feel like that can vary so much depending on the book club and what you like to read. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, kind of generically when I'm looking for stuff just overall, um, as I said earlier for nonfiction, I definitely look for a really good voice. Um, anything, you know, because in nonfiction, you had also said this a little bit earlier, Brenna, that you really enjoy stuff where you've learned something. And I think um, that is a, that can be a really big reason why people want to do book clubs. They want to read something that's maybe outside of the regular stuff that they're reading and to learn something from it is, it can be really valuable. Um, so nonfiction, you kind of feel like, oh, well, I could pick any nonfiction topic that we could learn something. Well, not every nonfiction is readable, right? So you have to find that really good narrative, strong voice. And that's, that's what I look for. And so when I read reviews of stuff, I really look for things that say stuff about the voice or about, um, you know, compelling reads or nonfiction that reads like fiction. That's a big thing that jumps out at me when I'm looking at reviews, for example. And then with fiction, because like you said, it depends, you know, different groups want different things. So just kind of generically, I look for things like strong characters or maybe unusual places. Um, if I'm looking for something that's in the contemporary fiction vein, I look for stuff that's got like social issues. I think um, as I was going through my list, I realized I, for almost every single one of them, when I was typing out, you know, this would be good for fans of, and I kept writing strong female characters, strong female characters. <laughs> and I was like, okay, Rebecca, maybe you're, you know, <laughs> being too basic here. But I think that that's important. Um, you know, to have those, those kind of strong characters. So that's, that's what I gravitate to. And I think that a lot of book clubs do as well. I definitely do. I think that's always a great selling point. Yeah. Uh, we had a great question in the chat. Um, do you know of any books that have been written about the pandemic? Um, and I, I feel like if we do this next year, that's going to be like <laughs> its own section. I haven't heard of any yet. I'm sure there must be some coming out I did read a book called Leave the World Behind, which is not, it's an end of the world book. It's not yes. a pen. Yes. Um, but that's that really one. good, um, like page turner, mystery, suspense. Um, I don't want to say too much about it, but it's it's an end of the world kind of thing. Um, 
Yeah, I, I haven't heard about books about the pandemic, but I know it's coming. Right. Same here. Um, I was, I also, Leave the World Behind was one of my top books of 2020. And it was really, I read it in like, I think July or August. So it was really kind of hitting that point where it felt a little too close to home because it is about the end of the world. And I was like, wait, what's going on here? Um, but I really like that kind of stuff too. Um, and I think, uh, you're right that we'll we'll start seeing some of these things for next year. Um, one of the things I've been doing when I have the opportunity to interview authors is that question has come up this year is, are you doing anything? Are you writing anything different because of COVID? Are you putting masks on your characters in books, for example? Or are they going to the grocery store and have to wait outside and stand six feet apart and all of that? Um, and Across the board, almost everybody has said, no, they're going to try and ignore it because they don't want to date their books too quickly. But they all said that definitely they can see people writing books specifically about the pandemic. But in their everyday normal course of book writing, they're not going to make note of it because they just they, they felt it was too raw right now and they wanted to stay away from it. <laughs> I think in the future, what we're going to see is anybody who is setting books in 2020 is gonna to have to deal with that in some way to make it realistic. So that'll be interesting. Yeah, someday it's gonna be historical fiction about the pandemic. <laughs> I'll think about that day. I lived through that. Yeah. Um, Anita is saying that their book club read The Plague by Camus to tie in with the pandemic. There That's, you go. there you go. And Station Eleven is also a great um, pandemic read. Um, Jen recommended that one. All right, so uh, another question that was sent in earlier are um, what resources do you use to find book club books? So Library Reads obviously is a great resource. <laughs> um, I also, I rely on Goodreads a lot. I, every book that I read, I rate it and um, sort it into categories there so I can go back and say, hmm, like what historical fiction have I read? And the good thing about Goodreads is that you can re read reviews from other people. So you can see, like, if you're not sure if you want to read something, you can see what other people thought about it. Um, any other ideas? Uh, yeah, you know, I always look, um, I think I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. When I read, I read a lot of reviews of books, as I think, you know, most people do if you're really trying to find something. And I do sort of read them with an eye towards, are they saying something about how it might be good for a book club? Are they, do they say something about compelling storylines or a unique voice or interesting characters? And I kind of, you know, I pick up on that. Um, hopefully people will use library reads, yay, since we do have this nice big vast archive of books. Um, and then I also, there's um, almost all of the publishers now, if you go to their websites, um, a lot of them will have a separate section specifically for, for their, what they've identified as good book club titles. And I think that those are, those are a good resource as well. Yeah, I'm also a huge fan of the celebrity book clubs. So yeah. Oprah is kind of the original, but now there's Reese Witherspoon and Jenna yeah. Bush. And I, I follow them on social media so I can see what they recommend because they always have really good choices. Um, one of the other questions we had that was sent in earlier was, how do you keep the momentum going? What are good ways of helping members feel engaged um, to offer up titles and become discussion leaders? So yeah, I mean, I have a personal book club with my friends and I run into that a lot where everyone kind of wants someone else to choose the book and lead the discussion. Um, so it can be hard. I think that allowing people to choose whatever kind of book they want to read can be, you know, a way to empower them. Also, you know, I can give you a discussion guide if someone's nervous, like, I don't know how to run a book discussion. Um, you can contact me, I can send you a discussion guide and it takes some of the pressure off because um, it'll come with questions and then you don't have to think about it yourself. Um, any other ideas? No, I agree. I think definitely um, it it really makes it easier when you have discussion questions already, so you don't feel quite so put on the spot to come up with them. Um, and that also is another good thing about checking the publishers' websites because oftentimes 
um, they'll have 10 questions ready to go for you, which is really cool. And sometimes, you know, if the book comes out in hardcover and then the marketing team at the publisher decides it's a good book club pick or it's been selected by somebody big, then when the book comes out in the trade paperback, they'll add those discussion questions in. But if you don't happen, happen to have that copy, they'll usually have it on their website as well. So I, I always, I don't think I can ever like go blind into a discussion. I have to have some pre-written questions ready for me. <laughs> And, and it's great because so many of those things exist out there. Yes, we've had a few more recommendations. So someone mentioned Clementine, which is about um, Churchill's wife, I believe, which I've heard good things about. Um, someone else said The Pull of Stars. Um, and we've got a couple more questions. Have you read anything this year that you hated? That's a great question. Hmm. I always keep that to myself. <laughs> yeah, I usually do too. But even in my Goodreads account, like I, I don't give stars on anything unless I really liked it. So I will give four stars or five stars, but anything else I just don't bother because I feel like I don't want to bring down the book's rating just because I personally didn't like it. But then I will move it to my did not finish shelf. And so you could like look there and see all the books that I really didn't like. <laughs> but I always feel like, you know, every book has a reader. And so I don't want to have my opinion color what anybody else might think about it. <laughs> I 100% agree. I, and I like I'll recommend books that I personally oh, did. Oh, totally. I know yeah. other people will like certain things about it. Absolutely. And I'm looking through the books I read last year and I honestly can't find one that I didn't find something to like about it. So. I had such a hard time getting into reading last year because of all the stress in the world that that I was just like, I, I would go and I check out these giant stacks of books. And then really, if it didn't capture me in like the first two or three chapters, I was like, nope, I've got too many others that, that I need something that's really going to get me. So my, my did not finish pile grew quite big this year. <laughs> yeah, I do that too. I'm not like I don't feel an urge to finish a book just because I started it. Like if yeah. I don't, like, I've got other things to read. I give it like 40 pages and then I get Yes. Back. Yeah. And I think that's just the way to go. Um, Karen recommends, she says she has her group come with one question that they want others opinions on. That is a great way to get people engaged. Um, everybody bring something to talk about. Um, and someone, this is for you, Rebecca, someone's asking yes. how to access the YouTube channel for the, those author interviews. I just saw that. I am going to put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Um, so hang on two seconds. I'm finding it right here. It's on our website if you go under events, but let me get you a direct link right to our channel. And I had mentioned this before, but both of our contact information will be on the last slide here, which I'll get to in a moment. So if you want to reach out to us with any questions. Yeah, totally. I love getting emails talking about books. Yes. Okay, so we've got that link there. Um, I'm going to move us on to our grand prize drawing. I'll keep an eye on the chat in case some last minute questions come in. Um, so... As we've all been talking, I've been taking your names and putting them into my little bowl so that I can um, have everybody who's in attendance in here. And so, you know, I'm not cheating. You can all see. And I wish I had some dramatic music or a drum roll or something, but um, we're gonna pick our winner. On my desk, if you want. <laughs> yeah. It is Natalie Masinski from the Great Pretenders Book Club. Congratulations, Natalie. And I will send you an email so we can, <laughs> she's chatting, wow. Um, I'll send you an email so we can figure out how you can get your prize. <laughs> she says, thank you, I'm so excited. I am excited for you. I know she's been uh, with our book club service for quite a while, so very exciting. Um, as promised, here's our contact info. I mean, we can hang out for a few minutes in case any more questions come in. Um, thank you all so much for joining us and keep an eye on your email in the next hour. I'm going to send that handout that has all the books that we've talked about. Um, 
So Rebecca, you're mentioning your chat and chew videos. Yes. Yeah. I always think it's kind of fun um, to get the author's perspective on stuff. And so, um, you know, one of the great things that I enjoy about my job is getting to do a lot of author interviews. And um, back when we could meet live, <laughs> I used to do a lot of them at the various library conferences. And now that everything has gone virtual, it's really sort of opened up that more people can hear these interviews than ever before. It used to be we didn't record them at all. It was just the people in the audience. And so we've actually decided that from now on, um, even when we do hopefully soon, someday get to go back to meeting in person, uh, Library Reads is going to record all of the author interviews that we do live and then put them on the website so that book clubs and general readers can find those and, and take a listen, so. Yeah, I'm very curious to see how all of this Zooming and on on online meeting is going yeah. to change things in the future if I know, maybe we'll start a permanent online book club at the library or something. Yeah, yeah. So I'm getting a lot more people coming to book club actually now that I'm doing it online, um, which is really cool to see. It is very cool. Agreed. We did get one more book recommendation. Um, Marcy says surprise favorite was Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland by Patrick Radden Keefe. Um, I've heard great things about that one. That's a true crime one. All right, I'm going to call it a night. Thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Bye, everyone. <laughs>